Yeah, thank you, Sandra. Um, I'm Anja Schwetje from the German Environment Agency, and uh, I'm also one of the co-chairs of uh, the CCAC Waste Hub and uh, of the Organic Waste uh, Group in the Prevent Waste Alliance. So with that very brief introduction of myself, I would like to hand again over to a very dear colleague and experienced expert in the field of waste and climate mitigation. Um, Nimi, please take us into the Indian scene and uh, give us some insights there. Thank you. Thank you, Anja and Sandra. So I'm Nimi Damodran. I have been working in the space of uh, climate mitigation efforts in the waste sector for over 20 years. And I've been working in a number of countries supporting the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Global Methane Initiative, CCAC since it started, and ISWA, the International Solid Waste Association. And lately my work has focused primarily on the on India and organic waste management in India. And so I'd like to present, just give you a little bit of uh, background on what is happening in India. So the key points I want to um, address here are what is the current waste situation in India? What drives the action, especially as far as anaerobic digestion of organic waste? and the scale of biogas projects that are happening in India. So India has a number of initiatives. India has long had biogas projects, especially in the rural areas, small scale biodigesters in at farms, taking advantage of agricultural residue as and producing biogas for cooking. But over the years, it has transitioned to larger biogas projects. Uh, it has a waste to energy program that is run by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy at the central government level. All of these are central government initiatives and there are numerous local initiatives as well. And this program provides a grant to for biogas projects and the grant is based on the output level, whether it is biogas production or if it's electricity is being generated, so based on electricity. So once the project comes online, they get a grant for a certain percent of their capital costs. And then another um, initiative is the Sustainable Alternatives Towards Affordable Transportation. The SATAT scheme that was introduced, I believe in 2019, had a um, goal of having about 5,000 biogas projects across the country that would produce bio-CNG for tra as transportation fuel. This was an effort by the Indian government to wean itself off of imported fossil fuel. And the way that one works was that oil marketing companies um, would guarantee a certain offtake price to biogas developers. Um, while they have not reached the 5,000 goal, it was supposed to be 5,000 by 2023, but there are a number of memorandum of understanding that the oil marketing companies have maybe even several thousand that they have, that they would, um, um buy or they would guarantee offtake. The Swatch Bharat mission is being run by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. This is uh, a clean India um, mission that is done both in the urban areas and the rural areas uh, focused on sanitation. So in the urban areas, it's very much focused on improving waste management. And one of the items it also focuses on is on organic waste management. Um, so that's where like composting, biogas project development, all of that is encouraged over there. And we see several large scale biogas projects coming in in support of Swachh Bharat Mission. It also has a ranking system which has cities competing with each other to improve waste management in their cities. Then there is the Goberdan, the Galvanizing Organic Bioagro Resources, that is focused more on the rural areas, but there are a number of places where cities and rural areas are uh, joining up to develop projects, since cow dung is also used in many of these uh, projects. And that is being run by the Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation, again, provides a lot of subsidies, grants for the promotion of these um, projects. And then finally, uh, more recently, the Reserve Bank of India, the Central Bank of India, has um, 
characterize compressed biogas sector as a priority lending sector. And what that means is when the Reserve Bank of India classifies certain areas as priority lending sector, banks are required to provide a certain percent of their loans to the priority lending sectors. So that has also encouraged uh, financing for these projects. And when Sandra makes uh, uh, the link available, um, or Martin, then all of these links should be live. So the next important thing is we need a market for these products. So when you have these anaerobic digesters, you have both biogas and digestate. The biogas is, can be used as cooking fuel, replacing wood and uh, LPG. LPG is a very common in cylinders. It's a common cooking fuel across India. Uh, then some of these projects generate electricity and the Satat scheme promotes uh, it as a transportation fuel. And EPA recently did a feasibility assessment of the direct use of biogas for coal storage. And this was done for a, um, a small village in Maharashtra, but many of the ministries and local governments have expressed interest in, in looking at this feasibility study in their vegetable markets. And then we have the digestate. So in some cases, digestate is sold directly to the farmers. And sometimes when the uh, it's used for urban forestry because India's cities, if you look at the landscape, um, most of the trees in major cities are distressed due to the poor quality of soil and the pollution. And then uh, there is also um, Fertilizer companies are encouraged. Initially, we thought it would be mandated, but now it seems uh, they are encouraged to use compost, uh, not compost, as well as like the digestate as part of the fertilizer that they sell to incorporate it. So I'm looking, uh, I thought I would just talk very briefly about different scales of biodigesters. It's completely arbitrary how I've classified them as small, medium, and large. So bear with me on that. So the small scale I'm looking at like less than five tons per day because there are even household biodigesters. This, the picture that I have, I saw is very interesting. It was in an apartment building with three or four apartments. And this person I know had a small biodigester and they use all the kitchen waste that's produced um, in, in these households to feed this biodigester. And the gas that is produced is used by the building caretaker for his cooking fuel. And then the digestate is used for all of, for the gardens around the apartment complex. I thought it was very interesting that people would do it even at that scale. And uh, the other small scale ones are like one and 1 1.5 tons per day. Uh, that are even found in cities. And then we move on to the medium scale ones. Uh, these are, there are quite a number of these. These are the five to, while I say five to 50 tons per day here, most often what we find are five ton biodigesters, sometimes a single one, sometimes two of them. And these uh, are found, the city of Pune has about 20 to 25 of this. Pune tried a scattershot approach where they, their waste situation was so bad that they tried everything. They had a waste to energy plan, they had biogas projects, they had composting facilities. It was pretty much, they had to close their landfill. There were so many protests about it that they just went for everything possible. And one of the things that seemed to work there at that point were these five ton biodigesters that were distributed across the city. And so it was a decentralized waste management. And one of the best examples we saw there was one of these biogas plan projects was devoted to getting waste from restaurants. And they produced electricity to uh, power the street lamps in the neighborhood, and they use the digestate for the local park. Now, um, one of the advantages have, of having this decentralized system was that if one of them breaks down, you don't have waste piling of the entire city's organic waste piling up. So it seemed to be a good model there. Then the large scale projects, these are the greater than 50 tons per day. You see several of them cropping up and uh, Nagendran, the speaker after me, is going to talk about a 100 tons per day plant um, that seemed to be very well run. And these 
while there are a few of them, I think there's one which is 500 tons per day in indoor that's being touted as the largest one in India. Uh, and a number of cities right now are considering developing 300 tons per day plants. Um, and I'll talk about some of the issues that have to be considered in the next slide. But one of the advantages is you have economies of scale, a centralized waste management system, and the gas can be used for electricity generation, transportation fuel, cooking fuel, and a number of uses. And the digest aid can be used as soil amendment. Um, and let's see. OK, so some of the key considerations here for any of these plants, particularly the larger plants, is feedstock quality. So segregation of the household waste is extremely difficult. And many times what happens is the municipalities sign on with biogas uh, developers, project developers, promising them uh, clean feedstock. But then they end up, it, it happened in the past with composting plants, happening again now with the uh, biogas projects, where they, pr they provide them mixed waste. And so that creates, then it's on, uh, up to the developer to sort out and get just the organic waste. And, and it's quite a problem there. However, the situations where organic waste is obtained from markets and bulk waste generators, that's a little easier. Next is the maintenance and operations, availability of trained labor, both to, uh, especially to run the operations. Um, and then the availability of parts, if they depend on foreign parts, if something breaks down, then waste backs up. Then the market for products, um, there's, uh, biogas has multiple markets, but the digestate market has to be more fully developed. And then last is what is happening with the digestate. This is a concern Anya has brought up many times. Um, in many situations, we see digestate just being um, disposed in waterways. And so you have continued methane generation and uh, a problem with environmental impacts of uh, having digestate move into the waterways. So this is a general landscape of uh, the situation in India, and I will pass it on to Nagendran. Yeah, thank you very much, Nimi. And yes, please, Nagendran, we, we heard from Nimi uh, the, the larger picture, how uh, actually India is addressing the biogas issue. And we now very keen on listening to you because you are one of these entrepreneurs, these people who really put everything in practice. Uh, thank you for your participation here and please go ahead. Thank you so much. And what a nice presentation made by Nimi. It has given us the full landscape of Indian biogas industry as a whole from the municipal solid waste. Myself, Nagendran, um, I am the CEO for Srinivas Waste Management Services based at Chennai, southern part of India. And we have been in the industry for the last 20 years. And uh, we have started with normal collection, transportation and dumping. That was long back, two decades back. But there's so many initiatives by the central government and the local governments um, there's a huge change in India, how it looked at the waste overall. So we expanded our portfolio into servicing all the solid waste management practices. And we branched out into not only collection and transportation, but also looked at bio mining, cleaning up of the old legacy waste. And then how do we address the fresh waste where it comes to bio CNG and then composting systems. We are also uh, equally qualified and we generated, created our own uh, ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning for Waste Management for the first time a decade ago. And we invest a lot of time on research and development along with the local universities in India. So we now quickly jump into bio CNG plant that we have in Chennai. It is the first 100 tons per day organic 
municipal solid waste based as a feedstock, the first South India's first plant of this size. And uh, Chennai, Greater Chennai Corporation is the first corporation who had initiated this uh, BioCNG thought process. The vision with the corporation was very good. How do we tackle the old legacy waste? How do we tackle the daily generating fresh waste? The proven organic method to generate to handle the organic waste, daily fresh waste, is to convert the bio CNG. So they, the Greater Chennai Corporation and our company went into a public private partnership mode, PPP mode, where we have developed the plant completely from design to uh, till today operation also. And uh, the land was given by the corporation Chennai, for which we pay a user fee. And in turn, the corporation gets a royalty fee also for the gas being generated by us, produced by us, sold to the customers. And we also, because of the experience of two decades of waste collection, we took an aggressive step that we, our company, come collect the waste from the bulk waste generated directly. As Nimi had pointed out in the previous presentation, the quality of the waste is very, very important to run this biosynergy plan successfully. So we have taken the aggressive step of collection directly from the bulk waste generator. We have uh, about 50 plus vehicles that run around the city um, 24 by 7 hours. So in this way, we are able to control the feedstock quality, which is organic waste and, feed, and the security. It's not seasonal. Waste is available all throughout the time. And by doing this properties, we are also collecting a tipping fee from the bulk waste generator. So we are able to get the feedstock from the bulk waste generator almost at low cost, literally zero cost. So we had developed the supply chain to support the bio CNG plant, where we control quality, security, as well as the cost. Now, as we are collecting the waste from the restaurants, city restaurants. So we are also creating a circular economy along with it. So we collect from the collect the waste from them, we process them, create a bio CNG, and then we supply them supply the biosynthesis back to them for their cooking applications. So that way, the hoteliers in local, they are proud. A good number of hotel people have already registered with us to use bio CNG. We'll talk more about it in the next subsequent slides. This is the operating model. So quickly, let me walk through this. And the, the blue, blue shaded area is the per view of bio CNG, where you'd see bio CNG plant, which gets feed and converting into bio CNG, supplying as supplying to hotels or supplying for automobile application and that, and the plant also creates manure for farmland applications. But this entire bio CNG cannot run successfully if not supported by the feed supply system. We have floated a separate company called Big Bin where we collect from these bulk waste generator hotels, restaurants, vegetable markets, apartments, supermarkets, and so on. And our vehicles go and collect daily. We, whenever we collect from them, we enforce source segregation. If not that in source, we cannot survive better. So organic waste is sent to the bio CNG plant for further processing, and the rest of the recyclables are segregated and sent to the recycling facilities. And then what could not be used anyway should be sent to the either landfill or incineration. This operational model helps us, though it's aggressive, this helps us a lot because many of the ULBs, if they supply to our location, our plant may not have a great, um, though the quantity is more, but the quality may not be good. And we have to spend a lot of time to segregate the waste properly. In today's scenario, we employ manual labors but we are also automating the waste segregation at our plant as required. Now we'll, I will take you through a small video of two minutes video that will give you a full glimpse of our plant. This is the top view. This is the collection point through our own vehicles from markets and hotels. And you see here the flower waste from the markets. They are 
fed into the system of uh, you know, grain, bio grinder, where the waste is pulped as a paste and sent to the aerobic tanks, where it's exposed to air as well as turning it multiple times along with the fresh water as well as slurry water. Then they are pumped to the two digesters. We will go detail into subsequent slides. But the video gives a full view. Once the biogas is generated, the next step is to have the purification system in place. This is the heart of the system for any bio CNG plant where we purify the biogas to bio CNG. And we have full SCADA systems installed to monitor every process point. So that's our compressor, and this is our filling point and uh, loading point. These cylinders are used for response. And the effective proof is about how the burners are being using the bio CNG being supplied. Various, uh, there are many 50 60 kind of burners that are being uh, using our bio CNG. I'm sure this would have given a good view of our plant. We'll go to the next slide now. Now I will delve detail into uh, the process steps of our plant. Um, we can primarily categorize the five to six steps. And the first steps being the feed preparation process. So we collect, from, collect the waste from uh, market and hotels uh, in both day and night shifts. And we also collect almost eight to 10 tons of uh, cow dung, which are acts as a bacteria catalyst for us. And we, in our plant, we segregate to a better extent and then mix with the cow dung in appropriate proportions. In the bottom left, you see a picture where the waste is being collected from the hoteliers. They are instilled with the plastic bags and then uh, vegetables collected from the vegetable markets. And um, generally, we avoid adding huge amount of acidic uh, nature fruits like lemon or orange as a bulk and rich organic matter, uh, uh, fibric matter. Okay. And uh, once the waste is segregated at our loading location, and we put them into a grinder system, where it's stirring up, it's just like a mixture in our home. Uh, it will uh, uh, cut, the, cut the waste into smaller pieces and then send to the aerobic tank. In the aerobic tank, we add equal amount of water, uh, Almost 70 to 80% of the entire plant's water has been recycled and fed back to the system itself. We add fresh water as we require. And so by doing this, so we, we feed the system multiple times. Agitation happens continuously in our um, aerobic tanks before fed into the digesters. This is the first process. We'll go to the so <clears throat> we'll go to the next step. Yeah, I'm in again. Okay. We are in the stage two right now, the digester. We have built this two digestive system, both are uh, in parallel, no sick, no serial. And um, our digestive system is based on CSTR, continuous flow stirred tank reactor mode, which means we have agitators, four agitators, each are the digester, two at the bottom, two at the top, uh, diagonally opposite way they placed. We have double membrane balloon system. And um, in the, with the help of agitators, we continuously uh, stir the uh, feedstock that being pumped through the, uh, from the aerobic tanks. And continuous stirring helps not the waste to set up, settle down at the bottom, and also helps to mix the uh, old digested inside the digester with the new stock coming in and ourselves to maintain the temperature. We maintain about 40 to 45 degrees centigrade inside the digester. And uh, Chennai climate is always hot, mostly hot, that helps the system to uh, you know, process better. 
and we'll go to the next one. Okay, I just have to change the view, just a second. Okay, now third stage is purification system and gas. Once the gas is generated, biogas is generated, as we all know, the uh, methane is about 55 to 60 percentage and carbon dioxide is about 30 to 35 percentage. The rest will be like N2 or O2 and other gases. So but when the biogas is generated, it has to be purified so that we can use it for automobiles or kitchen applications. So the, the purification system where we have implemented a technology called pressure stream adsorption that helps us in cleaning up as well as upgrading the biogas into bio cng now uh, we have the chemical absorber um, for um, uh, removing the hds content hydrogen sulfide and then series of steps through the psa processing absorption to remove moisture as well as further co2 and n2o2 in the system now, India has the standard, Government of India set up a standard, BAS 16087, which, which sets up the clear mandate to us, biogas, bio CNG generated should be having methane content minimum of 90 percentage and carbon dioxide should be less than 4 percentage and hydrogen sulfide less than 20 milligram per meter cube. So this standard is set up by the Government of India to ensure that there is a consistent composition of gas being supplied to the consumers. So once the entire purification process is done, we store them into a balloon. So in this picture, you see the left top left side, you see the purification system, which we saw in the video as well. The right, right side, the balloon is, is the balloon where we store uh, purified gas before compression process. Now at the bottom, you see a small picture with the numbers. That is our online monitoring system of the gas composition. Uh, this, this uses a differential uh, gas comparison. If you look at it, CH4 is 96 percentage, CO2 is less than 4 percentage, the rest of the gas also shown in this. This is a real-time analyzer, not the gas chromatography. And then subsequently, once the uh, purification is completed and stored in the balloon, um, before filling it up, we compress the gas through Bucard compressor, which is stage four. And this compressor can uh, uh, <clears throat> compress up to 250 bars pressure. Now, this being the gaseous form, uh, we have two kinds of application. In the stage five, you see a uh, cascade gas filling and storage. We are using this bio engine in two applications. One is for supplying to local restaurants where we pick up the waste also to enable the circular economy. We have our own cylinders, uh, a, cylinder, uh, a cascade of four cylinders where we fill it up the bio CNG with 190, 190 bars. And then with our own vehicles, we supply to the customer restaurants. And that place we reduce the uh, pressure to two bar, which can be, which is similar to LPG being used by the vendors or customers. And for the automobile vehicle, we have tied up with the local government, government uh, gas authorities of India and supplying with the 235 to 240 bars pressure in their bullet vehicles, LCVs, for the automobile applications. And the stage six where bio manure, which we talked in the previous slide also, and there is about eight to 10 tons of manure being created every day that can be subsequently processed, made as a compost given to farmers. In this picture, we see top uh, left corner is the compressor, Bukhart compressor by German, and that is very well known uh, compressor and runs uh, like work horse there. And then top right corner, you see the filling stations. Uh, simultaneously, we can fill up seven um, caskets of cylinders. And we also have introduced Metcap ton because um, you know, to have the uh, water is a sense for the gas being used for any emergency alarm purposes. And, and the 
bottom left corner, the vehicle that you see is the vehicle where we have 40 to 60 caskets used with the local gas uh, distributors. They can come, they come and pick up the gas from us directly with the 235 to 240 bar pressure. On the right side, you see small another vehicle where we have Paul Finger hydraulic board vehicle where we are where we lift our cascades and then deliver to the customer place. That's a, that's the stages in the uh, biogas plant. And yeah. and for such a biogas plant, um, based on our experience gathered on the ground in the last couple of years, the prerequisites are being listed here. Very, very important for such a biogas plant based on the feedstock is how do you get the feedstock at what cost, what is the quality? Because many of the input types like um, press mud or any other input types may have seasonal, but municipal solid waste, organic municipal solid waste is not seasonal. All the time it's available for us. So feed security is ensured in a city like uh, uh, Chennai. And then quality of the feedstock has been controlled by us uh, at the doorsteps. If not, then we also have an automated system where it can be segregated separately, organic and inorganic separately at the plant itself. Because we are collecting directly from the bulk waste generator and then corporation is not you know, sending the waste to us. We collect our own waste for which we collect a tipping fee. So that way we also nullify the cost of procuring the feedstock. So almost low cost or zero cost, we get the feed inside our plant. Then the second point, consumer application vibrancy, which is also important. Uh, the, who are the end users? Uh, if hotels, big hotels can use our bio CNG as an alternate to LPG. And uh, for um, uh, automobiles, anyway, now more CNG vehicles are prevalent in India. They are also, uh, they can also be used along with uh, uh, their LNG supply. So the market to utilize bio CNG should be vibrant. That helps the demand side matched up with the supply. And then we have built our um, bio CNG plant in three acres because we are in the middle of the Chennai town, Chennai city. But ideally, we would expect about 10 acres of land for to build 100 tons per day plant. So that, so that we can help with the manure production in a better way. And one another important prerequisite is because our plant does not use any uh, uh, any chemicals inside the digester. We we used cow dung collected across the city. Almost we initiated that digester with 300 plus metric tons, almost for two months. Post which only we started feeding the uh, uh, organic waste. Then of course we have to have that uh, local statutory clearance like a pollution control board or uh, any other compliance like factory or fire safety and so on. Apart from this prerequisite, there are some critical ongoing requirements that need to be met. There should be a continuous power supply. Uh, we use about 640 kVA per day in this plant. And uh, since solar is more prevalent in our city, and we have made a power purchase agreement with the solar producer to supply to our plant. Almost 80% of our 80% of our power has been through solar. And water requirements definitely required like because we we at least add equal amount of water, like 100 tons of water being added every day, but almost 50 to 70 percent being recycled every day. So that helps a lot. Then every day we don't add any other uh, chemicals in the digester. We add Cow dung, eight to ten tons of cow dung collected every day. That helps in the methanogenesis process, and we don't add any extra bacteria or anything else. It's completely organic and digested in very good health for the last two years without any problems. And the other issue, other things that will take care of local skilled labor because, as Nimi had pointed out in the previous slide, the equipments that we bought most of them are imported from German and uh, Belgium and so on, and. Uh, there are there are again now local manufacturers and of course big companies from uh, uh, German and uh, Belgium are setting up the local uh, set system also that helps a lot and labor availability is important and uh, parts and so on uh, that would be one challenge but I think we will be able to get through it 
in, in, in soon time. Finally, and uh, so I will talk about the benefits of setting up the BioCNG plant based on organic uh, MSW, municipal solid waste. I'll categorize into three buckets. One is what is the advantage for the, the manufacturer like, like us? So we generate about 4,000 kgs of BioCNG every day for 100 metric ton. And the price is guaranteed by the government of India. So there's a clear rate and uh, that helps us a lot, predictable. And we generate about eight to 10 tons of manure that is being sold at a, whatever rate being set up in the locally. Apart from that, we also be able to tap seven to eight, 10 tons of carbon dioxide. In city like Chennai, we can use it as uh, dry ice. We have not yet implemented. There's a good possibility of setting this CO2 plant inside the uh, current plant itself. So that is, with respect to revenue wise, is a very good model for the manufacturer provided the feedstock is in well controlled. What is the advantage for consumers? So I categorize in two or three buckets. First consumer, direct consumers like hotels, they get about 25% to 30% of savings when compared with the LPG usage. Just because two things, one is the rate of LPG is determined here in India monthly basis for commercials. And there is a efficient, better efficiency of biocNG compared to LPG. And then um, other problems like uh, there will be a pilferage in the LPG cylinders. Whereas in the L our biocNG, it is compressed form and then 180 bar pressure is completely utilized before being uh, lifted up by us back to our plant. And very importantly, there is also good uh, um, feeler from the kitchen uh, chefs that when we use this bio CNG, the heat generated is much lower than LPG. That gives them amicable uh, environment, ambience for the cooks to work in the kitchen. In Chennai goes to about 40 degree, 35 degree you know, most of the time. So that really is a very good uh, uh, update uh, given by our uh, users. Just to putting one more point, LPG India, just from cost perspective, currently LPG in India is 86.42 rupees per kg, whereas we supply bio CNG for 69.21 per kg. It's a straight away 20% discount completely. Apart from that, additional at least 10% because of efficiency and so on. And uh, with respect to automobile users, anyway, they can, they are using on behalf of uh, LP. Uh, on behalf of uh, petrol or diesel, there's a good subsidized rate for them and then good mileage for them. And then again, bio manure that helps the farmer if we continue to produce and there is a market being evolved. And what is the advantage for the municipal corporation that helps to set up such a plant? If they set up the larger plants like 100 tons plus minimum, and the, way, the handling headache of 100 tons or any number of tons, have been handled by the people like us, where the corporation saves huge amount of logistic amount, as well as dump yard maintenance. Thus, 100 metric tons of garbage, organic garbage does not go to the dump yard. That's a huge I know, uh, <clears throat> a benefit for the corporation. And then, of course, we are reducing the fuel fuel usage and uh, helps the country to move towards further net zero ambitions. Because we, we are ta tackling two problems at a time. One is waste that impacts directly the environment as well as the energy requirements of the country. There are additional benefits of setting up the bio CNG plant. In India, we have uh, uh, government is giving you a subsidy as detailed in the previous presentation. Um, that's helping, helping the uh, producers a bit more, definitely. And then setting up a bio CO2 plant, carbon dioxide plant helps additional revenue. And there is a good amount of carbon credit because we are able to prevent 100 tons of organic waste going into dumping. So we are able to calculate and then it's about 28,000 emission reduction points annually that we save. Uh, currently, um, each ERU val is valued at $4.5 USD. And that um, credit also comes to us, comes to the manufacturers of the biogas. And uh, every rise in the demand that anyway increases, 
and there is also uh, derivative benefits when we collect the waste from the people it it may not only the organic waste there could be some part of dry waste and if we can segregate the dry waste better we can uh, we can send them for recyclers with uh, some fees for that also so some for small amount of revenue that comes along with it and if you get more dry waste we can also think about captive power reclaims we can generate our own energy by waste to energy plant inside here that summarizes i have one small presentation one 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 slide here if you see we have uh, i was saying about how do we supply the feedstock to the bio cng plant from the bulk waste generator and these are the type of vehicles we use to collect from all the people these are one tonner one ton, these vehicles carry one ton uh, so you know, that's how we run it and the right hand side is a small uh, screenshot we have a mobile app also to ensure waste is being collected transparently and from the every you know, vendor of us so the restaurants will get a app like this they can monitor uh, how much of waste being picked up by our team and uh, this is completely gps enabled that is being piloted across chennai city so pretty much that summarizes our uh, biocng plant and how do we operate our operating model how do, how the benefits being passed to various stakeholders by setting up such a plant Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Na Nagendran. That was really impressive. And it shows not only your contribution to Indian circular economy, yeah, but also to climate mitigation and even to stabilize the soils. I mean, you have really the full package, including that you get the energy from solar. That is impressive. <laughs> Very interesting <laughs> indeed. I guess a lot of people will now have questions to you and uh, Nimi. However, I would really ask uh, for some patience. Any question you have, please write it in the chat. We will call upon it later because we have another presentation now, which takes us again back from that one plant which you presented. And I'm, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm just completely impressed. <laughs> so um, to, let's say, the larger picture, because we have your plant and your skills and your activity, but we need more of this, I guess, in India, yeah? Uh, you agree with that and you probably only won. So we need to scale up. We need to look into what can we do uh, and how can we can kind of carry on with this variable examples. So with that, I would like to introduce you now to Professor Dr. Weichgrebe, uh, who will give us more again uh, of a bird view insight uh, into the Indian anaerobic digestion um, um, let's say challenges and opportunities issue um, yes uh, dr weichgrebe professor dr weichgrebe please introduce yourself and go ahead floor is yours yes i hope i'm still audible yeah so my you name is audible. yeah my name is Dirk weichgrebe i'm uh, from the faculty member of the leibniz university of hanover and I'm also a coordinator of the uh, focus area waste in the Indo-German Center for Sustainability, uh, which is located at IIT Madras. And uh, I would like to say something about my our 10 years experiences, but where to start. So even it starts in Chennai. So occasionally we have the same city uh, we heard from the previous speaker. But what I like to express today is something like a model which we even can go for other cities too. But this was our first impressions, and uh, we had here the Koyambedo Wholesales Market Complex in Chennai, with a lot of shops, a lot of waste, and even daily coming. And also what you see on the right side is the slaughterhouse in Chennai. We also have seen a lot of slaughterhouse waste was directly tipped on the street, and uh, here we would like to find a solution. And from that, we made a German-Indian dialogue, so we made a different way. So we invited the Indian people to come to Germany, the experts. We show them around, make field trips, and we have seen, we have made in Germany, make in India, uh, and we came to a conclusion what we could find. At the end, it was uh, Germany has overdeveloped technologies which are not applicable in India, and the applicable concepts and process must be developed for India. So this was our conclusion. And uh, in this time also, we had this uh, Swatch Bharat mission. Even Chennai was one uh, of the cities which were uh, selected. 
And from this perspective, we started uh, our project and sustainable urban organic waste management system under smart city and such bar emissions. This was our flag and banner we, we, we uh, drove. And at present, I have seen uh, in, in Chennai, we have 23 biogas plants with around about uh, uh, nine uh, uh, mega, uh, metric tons per day. So it's not so big. Um, now I've seen a bigger one, but this is what now the present st statistic says. Only 23 plants with uh, um, nine me metric tons per day. And in our uh, in survey, we also made, we looked for the Koyambedo market. We had 170 tons per day uh, uh, generated. We looked for the Perambedo slaughterhouse. It was nine uh, metric tons. And this we would like to gain. We have heard uh, previously that cow dung looks as a catalyst. Uh, we see the slaughterhouse not as a catalyst. I will explain why we see this even as something. This is a consortium we had. We had two Indian uh, uh, um, partners. This was the Central Research Institute and Rumpke Company as an industrial partner our institute and also some Lehmann. Why we have this company? Because uh, we found out that we have to have a resource recovery from the municipal organic waste, but they are slaughterhouse waste, and this has to be uh, hygienized or sanitized because you could have even uh, um, pathogens inside. We would like to have a cost-effective renewable energy plant in India, sanitization, and what we also faced was that we have a lot of fibrous substrate in the wedge market, in the wholesale market, so how to deal with the fibrous uh, substrates even in biogas plants? Dietostate application later on, because what you feed in, you will get out. Even I would like to ask my speaker, because uh, you have 100 tons per day, you must have 90 tons per day dietostate, and <laughs> this must be used for. And then we have uh, some integration, economic, social, environmental context in Chennai City. But what I said, I like to have it as a model for the entire system. What we also looked for, we have slaughterhouse waste, fruit, vegetable waste, flower waste. And uh, we see that we have even, even some inhibitors inside these wastes. So if we deal with waste, we have to look how the microbes can deal and handle it. So not all AD process is only functioning. We could have more ammonia, we could have more fatty acids, and we could have hardly degradable lactocellulosis. That's why we thought about the co-digestion. Co-digestion means we have more, more than one substrate. This was the slaughterhouse and this was the uh, um, flower market waste. And, and the wedge market waste, because we would like to balance this uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio, the pH, the reduced toxicity, and also to increase the biodegradability. Also, the coach digestion helps us to enhance the biogas yield, the methane share, organic dry matter reduction, and so on. The other solution was that we even better, we have to control even the carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, because all the microbes need anyway this as a nutrients for their metabolism. Uh, other pretreatment was that we say we have lignocellulosis biomass, how we can degrade this material to take down. And this was why the German company comes in. This is so called bio extrusion system. This is a two screw press which helps to, uh, let me say, break down by friction the fibers. But also, if the friction is there, the temperature is raised, and this temperature helps us to hygienize the uh, slaughterhouse waste. So this means you can directly use this machine at first for um, pretreatment and degrade the uh, cellulose and also to hygienize the slaughterhouse waste. This is the plant what we built up. I think you have seen nice pictures before in the movies, uh, nearly the same. We have the wedge market waste, we have a shredder, anaerobic digestion plant, biogas is coming out, but then we have the fiber organic waste, slaughterhouse waste. This we feed now in the bio extrusion system for hygienization and fiber breakdown. And at the end, we have the digestate, and the digestate also, we would like to have a nutrient recovery, biogas, we looked for the uh, Indian-specific biogas utilization, which we heard uh, previously in the slides itself. This was then uh, uh, done. We made this pre-treatment and co-digestion of all the vases. We used this skin crew, but however, we always like to have um, better insight, so we do lab-scale studies before. So we study the substrates in particular, to see, do we have an effect? Uh, what is about the toxicity? What about the carbon nitrogen ratio? And so on. Uh, followed by continuous reactor studies, and I would like to show you why. Before we then come to the technical scale operation, we study the uh, wholesale market to understand which waste is when coming, because you have seasonal fruits. Sometimes you have only melons, then you have only mango, then you have only this way. And if you run a, a D plant and the substrate is changing, I have seen this in the bio Bima plant. Uh, the substrate is changing, even the AD behavior of the plant is changing. So we have to understand 
uh, which waste is coming. So we made the survey and found when monthly which product is coming and even which waste is produced. It was hard to get the data, but we anyway matched it. And uh, it comes out that we have, uh, you see, uh, the first column is how much tons per month is the uh, product, uh, the waste of it. And the uh, second column is how much of the products is served. So around about 10% of the input product in the market is waste. So from this, you can know how much waste is, is coming uh, monthly. And it's always the same uh, over the time. Then we do the lab scale trials only to see how much uh, waste can produce the biogas. Uh, uh, we've found that we have uh, lower uh, demands as calculated, but however, we would like to see that we can have a, a, a compositional, that we have a substrate management of that. Not too much data, please follow only the yellow one. So we found out uh, if we do a mixture of slaughterhouse waste and the uh, uh, wedge market waste by the ratio of one to three, we have the highest, uh, uh, the best uh, CN ratio and the highest out, sorry, one, uh, and the highest outcome. Also, we know that uh, if we have the pH was the best and even the ammoniacal nitrogen was in the best place, but we would like to use the one to three ratio in our next stages. And we looked for, shall we go for extrusion or not? Because sometimes you use the pretreatment, this needs energy. And if you say more energy is needed to operate, so why shall we go for? So we found out, uh, you see the first column, uh, yellow plates uh, is the um, specific methane yield, which we have by uh, unextruded. And then we see in the uh, second yellow that we improve, increased our uh, material uh, uh, tremendously. From this, we then go to the uh, lab scale continuous reactor states and uh, a little bit different to Indian style. In, in our country, we do not, let me say, categorize the plant in tons per day because tons per day uh, says nothing about the size of the plant because you have an organic loading rate. So this means you can have a small plant with tons per day, a big plant. So what we're looking for is mostly the organic loading rate and the output, how much methane is produced. So this is our this differentiation which we have. So we investigated different organic loading rates and we found out that in our uh, sales, so this is only to get the idea, that we come up with a solution, the organic loading rate, how much gram organic dry matter per liter a day uh, is the best. And you see it was 2.5 uh, um, by the extruded material. And from this, we then calculate how much organic dry matter was removed. It was uh, to 82%. How much biogas produced? It was uh, 620 uh, uh, liters per kilogram organic dry matter. So this was then the design concept for the full scale plant, which we still follow. This plant was then built up in the premises of the Central Lab Research Institute. It was a 60 cubic meter reactor, organic loading rate, as I said, 2.5 kilogram organic dry matter per liter and day. And then the bioextrusion system was also there. This is the extrusion system. And then we use the input. And at the end, we also made some application tests for the uh, digestate. How does this improve uh, uh, the lens and, and the soil and the usage? At the end, the results were we operate them 180 days uh, with 500 kilo, uh, kg per day in the ratio of uh, uh, three wedge vehicle waste to one slaughterhouse waste ratio. The extrusion helped us to have a 45% higher uh, outcome of the material. And the composition of the methane was constantly around about 45 to 60. So we have not gone here for the, uh, we say, membrane cleaning. Biogas purification through scrubbing system composed with iron fillings and activated aluminia so that we could also decrease the uh, hydrogen sulfate. And the selected slaughterhouse waste is applicable and sanitized. This was very much important for us to know that the application of this extrusion system really helped us to degrade and get this material in. We made a multi-criteria decision analysis for the biogas utilization, and we found directly for cooking is, is the best instead of Stirling engine or gas turbine in this uh, particular system. The, the daily waste generation uh, could achieve a saving of uh, 62 tons equivalents per day, which is equivalent to the city of uh, Chennai, and also it landfill gas could be avoided. And to study it more, we also made a uh, potential of the Chennai city as an example, which we also look for others. This means this is a map of Chennai, and we made a uh, GIS mapping where waste is arriving. So we looked for where are, we have some markets. You see there are some chicken markets, fish markets, uh, Koyambido veg market. But also we look for how 
much waste is produced and generated in the town itself. Even to localize where would be the best uh, um, setup for a new biogas plant. So we look for all the waste which could be there, fish market waste, chicken waste, residential organic waste, canteen food waste too. And we found out which are the main hotspots in waste generation. This we compared and studied. So we made a batch test. We put out, okay, what are the specific methane activities? And we could find uh, some deeper insight. And at the end, we could come up, okay, we have different areas where we can have uh, some uh, plants set up. And then we can combine, let me say, the organic rest organic waste from the municipalities itself. This is then the separated uh, view. We say, okay, at first you see the waste generation, you have seen the number already, 170 tons uh, by Koyam Bedo market, the biogas potential. And if we then take the rest of the, without, uh, but with some waste additionally, and this is when, if we can take the entire rest uh, organic waste from the municipality. So then you see where the potentials are in a city where we could set up a biogas plant that not every household should have a small unit because even this is resources which we have to separate and save. The last few I like to share, biogas generation is, is, is a very good uh, approach to recover nutrients and the energy, but however, we should have a broader concept. Uh, we have an advanced bioenergy solution which we said. We have another project where we'd like to have the pyrolysis in, even again, such kind of a two plus two project. We built up this material. We have the fiber organic waste sewage sludge in a solar dryer. Then we have a pyrolysis and we gain biochar. And this biochar and this single chamber pyrolysis delivers also energy and heat. And this heat could also be used as a, for the cold storage in the Koya Ambedo Vetch market. So we get the waste from the Koya Ambedo Vetch market, but can give, a, get, give back the cooling uh, for the veg market itself. <clears throat> this is now the plant facility, which is built up. We can have better insight later on, but I will say this is now on the premises built up to see how does it function. And our perspective is applicable process technologies and approaches, where you add the products out of waste, biogas, biochar, digestate, and energy. And we can combine. We have the bioexuder AD plant, solar dryer, pyrolysis. We have the waste from the veg market, from the canteen, slaughterhouse, fibrous organic waste, sewage sludge. But every waste has, let me say, an, a better uh, usage, not only AD, not only pyrolysis. So we can see where does it come in. And then at the end, we find out, because we have to address it to the market, what will be products. This will be energy, this will be biogas, could be biomethane, could be fertilizer, could be ammonia-rich water could be biochar, could be thermal energy, which can be used directly internally. So we have even to see there is a bigger view, not only for AD to go. And at the end, this is the task we have to fulfill. I think we need a biomass inventory, not put everything in one tank. We have to look, is it available? What is the composition? Shall we go for decentral or central units? Do we need process or pretreatment design? Do we have a separate hydrolysis? Do we need an extrusion? The substrate management is very much important. You talked about the uh, catalytic effect of the, the cow dung. We look for sanitization, C2P to N ratio, signet and cellulose. Even the digestate treatment application, do we have nutrient recovery? Do we can have humus formation? And here we look also for the certified, uh, certified product quality. It must be fulfilled not only the standards, also some kind of uh, toxicity test. Sustainable biogas civilization, we have seen already before. Emission control, very much we have methane slip, how the methane is coming to the atmosphere and will cause some kind of uh, carbon uh, uh, effect in the greenhouse gases. H2S, I have seen in a lot of uh, Indian biogas plants even coming out of the domes, coming out of something. This is a very uh, big issue. And the leachate. After the digestate you have, how to handle all this leachate and the liquid. And in our country is very much important the safety measures and the economic and ecological evaluation. This was my view about the uh, ideas which we had. I did not have so much time. <laughs> I could have speaking slowly, but however, I would like to give you the overview of what is in our perspective. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Weichgebe. And uh, you really, I mean, brought us a broadening of vision in terms of feedstock, but also in terms of planning and how the science plays 
is, is placed and, and actually can support the developments here. And yeah. you showed also that AD plants can be part of a broader concept. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. that it is not all about, yeah, uh, one business model, but probably one business model is a stepping stone to another broader system. <laughs> yeah. I hope it was also interesting for you, Nagendran and um, Nimi, and uh, probably also between the three, the exchange continues because coincidentally, we, you work all in the same city in big India. So we are not actually targeting uh, Chennai in any way, but you could say Chennai obviously offers fantastic opportunity for you entrepreneurs and scientists and um, uh, to kind of really work there. So it is a good working ground. And um, yeah, happy that we are all meet virtually in Chennai. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so um, with that, I would really um, go to the question and answer session. Um, and um, I have I have two comments actually more in the chat, which congratulate us on this webinar. Very interesting, but two people needed to drop out. Um, and then um, another one from Noah Climate said, we would really, we would really come into discussion here. That was really interesting for us. So there's a stretched out hand of, of doing more. Again, very interesting and impressive. Another comment. Excellent presentation. And so here the first question. <laughs> and it's to Mr. Nagendran. Um, do you evaporate the water from the digestate? Or when you say manure, do you mean liquid fertilizer? Uh, um, please. Uh, please explain because uh, Martin Rohleder, he's concerned about the question of the water, yeah, which we would also save in irrigation. Nagendran. Absolutely. That's a very good question. Uh, we have both the type of manure, liquid, liquid as well as uh, solid. We don't evaporate the liquid because there are farmers who want to get liquid manure and uh, the solid part through the screw press, we remove the uh, solid part. That part is uh, further go undergoing the composting and then sent to the farmer. There are some people definitely wanting to use the liquid itself, liquid slurry itself. And uh, since we are also recirculating, most of the liquid is already recirculated inside the system itself. Okay, then there's another question in the chat, which is more on organization. Again, to you, Nagendran, is yeah. private collection from large waste generators mandatory in Chennai? Or is there any specific program in place? Or is it basically your own doing? <laughs> another <laughs> interesting question, definitely. Um, in Chennai, Chennai is the forefront uh, city. Uh, which has taken waste management practices in place by various initiatives and uh, one of them from in fact from central government of india has mandated with the solid waste management rules 2016 then further upgraded later on that mandates all the bulk waste generator whoever generates more than 100 kg of waste every day they come under bulk waste generator those generators have to employ either uh, expertise or ensure they process their own waste. They cannot use corporation or municipality service for that. It is a polluters to pay model. <laughs> okay, so in Chennai, they have a panel set of uh, experienced people, organization to collect the waste from the bulk waste generator. We are the largest player in Chennai. We are collecting more than 500 plus places every day. So as you said, yes, there is a mandate. It's strictly followed by Chennai Corporation, but it's being slowly being adopted to all other corporations. So the more you pollute, more you have to pay. 
that's a mod I'm getting in. Okay, thank you. And I think that leads to the third question, which I would pass on to Nimi first, but maybe then also to the other speakers, which is more related to the framework. Yeah. In uh, are there new policies or incentives by the government? You just mentioned one, yeah, Nagendran, which is definitely and in a kind of incentive, but Nimi, maybe you can tell us more about probably recent policies yeah. or incentives. So I had highlighted the recent policies, but I, I absolutely want to add on to this point that Nagindran was just talking about that bulk waste generators have to treat their own waste on site or go with the panel vendors. And this is this has to happen across all of India. And what we have found working with different cities is yes, Chennai is being good about it. Some cities and every city has to have a set of M panel vendors. So the city identifies the vendors that the bulk waste generators have to use. And what we have found is many cities are not even completely aware of the requirements of the rules. So many municipalities are still continuing to collect from the bulk waste generators. And so uh, really uh, what we find is some of the municipalities, especially the municipal commissioners, the municipal commissioners change every two to three years. So that in itself is a problem and you need champions at the local government in order to effect these kind of changes and following of the rules and all of that. Uh, as far as incentive goes, one of the incentives that we have found is working in India right now is this whole star system where the central government is ranking cities through a survey on an annual basis, a biennial ba basis, and they uh, rank them as three star cities and five star cities. And I think indoor is one of the cities with a seven star ra ranking. And so now cities are competing to improve sanitation. Waste management is one of the factors. So that has driven action as well. So as such, there I, I don't see incentives per se in terms of financial. Uh, the, the earlier things that I mentioned, just just the grants and the availability of funds to do it, those are the incentives. Okay, so and I think as also was mentioned by the two other speakers, there is a framework where the energy is bought off. There seems to be interest really in pro in the product. Yeah. The uh, gas. So the gas, yeah. So uh, so that is definitely also fueling some of the developments, I guess. Yeah. Anya, one uh, other quick comment I would make is that yeah, uh, what is interesting among all of the three talks is, you know, I've been doing this both, you know, on behalf of EPA and we went and saw the Coimbedu market and um, Dirk also mentioned the Coimbedu market because they looked at the waste and um, Srinivasa Waste Management actually processed some of the waste from Coimbedu market because it's like a very, it's a large generation of organic waste that has to be dealt with and the market itself is interested in doing something about it. it so it's a matter exactly. of finding opportunities. Yes, obviously in champions and people which are interested. And I mean, also, uh, as Professor Weichgrebe showed, there's definitely room for enlargement. When we look at the, into the potential, the sheer potential, when you take into account all the relatively pure sources, yeah, I must find I was impressed. And I don't know, Nagendra, do you see new business opportunities for you there now? <laughs> uh, everyday learning and a very, very, you know, uh, very, very interesting the professor's presentation. He, he was in our city, he studied that. I want to definitely collaborate for that to make it better for all. Yeah, and, and with that, I would call another question um, to the floor, which is from Brigitte Patel. Um, uh, Brigitte, uh, please uh, go ahead with your question. I know you are uh, interested in developing also these Indo-German Indo ties. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, everybody. It's very nice to see known faces, known experts. Uh, Nagendra, we personally never spoke, but I've always been in touch with Dr. Subash, who has designed your uh, complete plant. I have been having an exchange. My only one question is, you made it very clear your business model works because your source of waste is clean and you have the control. 
should I also understand it otherwise? If the waste is not in your control and the municipal corporation is just going to dump it in your site or you pay tipping fee to get it, will you be able to run a plant? Okay, Vijay, thank you so much for that question. Definitely we had to connect more. Um, if municipal corporation is dumping or providing with a nominal fee, and there is a model in Chennai itself for another plant that has been operating for the last few months. For a ton of waste, the municipal corporation is charging rupees 50 rupees, which is very, very nominal, or 35 rupees, very nominal. But as you put it rightly, uh, quality of waste is a fundamental problem. Uh, so in order to avoid depending upon the quality, we are putting our own system to segregate organic, inorganic, then implying the label, like a deep packer system. So that gives them more advantage for us because uh, the way we have learned the hard way is that uh, by employing people, we still have the, some of the plastic and so on escape into the system. So it is still viable, definitely, by putting automated system to segregate even at our plant, even at our own cost. Uh, because corporation only charges 35 rupees per ton, which is very, very small. Got that? I would love to believe that it will work, but it's okay. If you are confident and you are ready to build it. My one last question is just what is the total solids as it comes to your plant and the total solids in your digester? Because you have chosen the CSTR. I'm sure you have a very good reason for that. Right. We, the current, our, our, uh, our lab rest test on that around 3% solid right now in the digester. In the digester, 3%. Correct. All right. Thank you. And what it sure. comes like when it comes as a waste to you? What are the total dry solids or any idea? Somewhere around you know, 60 to 60, around 60 percentage. Yeah. OK. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Great. you very much. All right. Yeah. I, I see a hand raised by Professor Weichweber. Please go ahead. Yeah, I would like to uh, say also something to this point. Uh, even we uh, have seen some plants and operators in, in India, and then we spoke with them, and then maybe the gas uh, uh, combined heat and power station was not in operation. Then I asked him, why is it not in operation? Because then you say, yeah, the power is subsidized, so we can't compete. And the other was that they say even the uh, uh, maintenance oil was sometimes more expensive than the uh, revenue from the power itself. So this means obviously you have to compete with the market. So this this means you must have a solution. Even I've seen one plant in Bangalore. It was very well built up. It looks like the plant we have seen on video. Even with the bottling, uh, there was an, everything fine. But at the end, he couldn't do it because he did not find the people who give him the waste and the people who take the product. So there must really some uh, uh, chain which you create and which should be con not controlled, but should be really uh, reliable to that. And this is, is possible, not a problem, but you have to look on the market and, and address this. Yeah. It cannot be all, everything done by the, uh, by the, uh, by the government. <laughs> you must have even some relations. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Nimi, you raised your hand. Yeah, I just want to also raise the point that Brijesh Patel brought up. Uh, Nagin, even though you said that it's possible for you to have the deep packer, if you get like seriously the mixed waste with so many different things mixed in, I think that is still going to be a problem, which is why like we're all focusing, you know, you can depack it, but you know, when you have so many different contaminants with the organic waste that comes especially with the household waste. I'm not sure how effective that will be because I've just seen compost plants fail. We went and saw in Madurai a composting plant, which was like half of it, it seemed like was plastic. So um, I'm hoping that that source segregation, the municipal solid waste rules in India, by the way, for the others, requires households to segregate it, to separate their organic waste from their dry waste. And that's not happening again. It's not being either not being instituted because the municipalities are not aware and some municipalities are aware of the rules, but they're not able to. So one of the areas that I'm working on um, with primarily with EPA is how do you get that source segregation happening? Because a few cities are able to do it. One city is even going through a 16 way source segregation. So what makes it work in those cities and how can the lessons learned 
in India itself be applied to other cities. Um, because this whole trying to treat mixed waste is just a huge problem. If, can I just add that point as well? You are right, right. If we are definitely, we are changing the pattern of how the apartment generate the waste because we measure that every apartment location. So more we concentrate on the restaurants where we have more food waste. Right now we are able to do that um, because we are the only large player. And from the hotels, we are collecting about 300 to 400 hotels every day. That gives us a huge um, ammunition to run it better way. And vegetable market. If I have to rely upon apartment or any other malls and so on, it's very difficult, definitely. Mm. Um, yeah, and I think one of the clear, clear issues which we heard is feedstock. Yeah, because what goes in, goes out. Uh, I see Mr. Uh, Professor Weichgeber raising his hand. Yeah. So this issue of feedstock definitely is something which uh, will impact your quality, your product and your market. So Professor Weichgeber, please go ahead. And then I take again uh, the next taste raise hand from the floor. And please, everyone takes down yeah, the hands um, who, who has a, a, a had existing from previous interference. Please go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to say something even for this uh, um, uh, feedstock, because we work with the Koya Medo market waste, and even we have seen uh, 50 tons per day is only banana peduncle. So this means you have a lot of cell loss. So this means uh, even from that, and then you go through the market, and then you see the, the shops and the people even drink some coffee in between, do something else even. So we had to have an idea how to separate even on the Koyambedo veg market. You have a huge amount of organic waste, but still polluted by plastics and, and even some bad. And you can have a better insight. So this is what I, I mentioned before. If we have a map where the waste is coming, we can see where are the good resources and where are not the good resources. And from this particular perspective, we can say, OK, here, this uh, biogas plant in this area, Will have a more higher outcome than the other ones and we can then have a better segregation so this means uh, uh, through this survey we can even then see which waste should go in which direction and where is the best source segregation and where we can even uh, uh, have more awareness then we can can even go there and do a management there on the ground and say you will have benefit if you segregate and how to do so yeah, maybe one question from my side before I would call Sven Schala to the floor would be um, to Nagendra and Nimi. Uh, we see that science is able to produce these maps, yeah, because they, the universities can do it. Yeah, are you are you thinking as entrepreneurs to do that? Is the city somehow even considering to do organic mapping? Um, maybe the short question, short answer to all three of you. Um, would it would it be something you would invest in to understand your feedstock better and to get more material, or would you say no? I am so short of funds that needs to come from somewhere else, Nagendran. Okay, so that's interesting. So. Uh, definitely, we will look at look at the study. Definitely, each city has different characterization of waste. So that is the first and foremost. Economic viability of running your plant in a particular city is based on its own characteristics. Definitely, then comes the fun. <laughs> okay, great. My thirty uh, second. My thirty yeah. second thing is, uh, you know, all the dedicated organic waste, wherever you can get that, that's a low hanging fruit. So the fact that people are going after the market waste, restaurant waste, that's great. It's low hanging fruit. And we take advantage of that while we figure out how to improve source segregation to get cleaner waste across the city. OK, so uh, I would then call the last question to the floor, Sven Schala, uh, please, your question. <laughs> Yes, so thank you very much for the presentation. So my name is Sven Schaller from the DBFZ, the German Biomass Research Center. We did a similar study uh, for Bogota. So and we presented this study uh, at the Retech conference last year. So I, I think Chennai and Bogota have well, roughly the same uh, kind of uh, in our number of inhabitants. So in Bogota, we speak about 3,500 tons of organic waste a day. And one aspect we have not talked about today is space. 
So you, you have presented your very brilliant um, uh, business model with CNG production with 100 uh, tons a day, which is really small. But in Bokota, we uh, quickly came to the question where to build up those plants in the uh, city area because there is no place so for such a huge amount. And then we come to logistics and costs. Have you considered all the three of us uh, this aspect of logistics, costs, uh, space for building up those biogas plants? Considering that all the other aspects also was uh, what uh, Nimi mentioned with uh, segregation and uh, actually the uh, quality of the collected organic waste is very important, but the issue of space is something in our point of view that should be considered. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Sven. Maybe I give the question first to Nagendra because you already mentioned that you would need more acres if, if, <laughs> yeah, and then to Nimi and Professor Weichgrebe. Uh, uh, okay, so the particular point is very valid. And uh, I, that the model that we adopt in India, at least many cities now, decentralized CNG plants. Okay, and that way helps the logistic management this little hassle and not depending upon one single or two plants in a city. So definitely go for uh, uh, decentralized model, even at least minimum of 100 tons, 7,500 tons will be of economic viable and decentralized model in a city like this. Mm. But do you have problems with space in, for example, to your experience? Uh, Would you need the, more area for your plant to flourish? Absolutely, it would be better because for manure creation, we definitely need a larger space. And uh, though we have built it in three acres, we would need 10 acres, or at least eight to 10 acres, that range. Uh, but since being the first one experimented all these things, we are able to say that we need more now. Okay. But when now we are proposing to many corporations and so on, we are asking for larger space. In fact, and the Coimbatore. Yeah, right. so there is space available when you cooperate with the authorities, apparently. That's right. They, they, okay. They, we go with the, sorry, sorry, we go with the PPP model where corporation gives the land because their support is also on the local definitely record in terms of waste collection and you know, management. Definitely they would be having the land that they will give it to us on the PPP model where they get the rent as well as royalty model applied. Ah, interesting. So, Professor Weichgrebe, you raised your hand. Yeah, because the question from uh, Mr. Schaller was really the reason why we made the skiz mapping. The skiz mapping was not only to do an, an, a survey where the waste is coming. We also would like to see where we can place the, the plants, so the space, which space is available, and even where can we set up such kind of things. And, and even we made an investigation, even for the entire waste transport, waste collection. We look for CAPEX, OPEX, and, and even look how we could collect, how we transfer the waste. Even we have transfer stations in the city to see, do we have a surrounding, what is the distance? So this was the idea to do this GIS mapping. And still, we believe that city planners, even the corporate uh, city general corporate also uses such kind of um, techniques. And only there must be matched together. So we should not think in sector of city planning and in and, and sanitation, hygienization. We bring this people together and say, okay, this is my city planning, but look on the infrastructure, look on the energy provision, look on the waste treatment. Still, we struggle here in Germany to bring wastewater, waste, and energy together. But yeah, it's, it's, it's so. Yes. And uh, but this is why we go over this to have this, this mapping as, as a tool. To, to because I'm a process engineer, we're looking for the mass flows, we're looking for energy flows, and why not do the waste flows and, and the gas flows? Yeah. So this is our idea to to address this and to have a, an answer to to answer this question: Do we have space? Do we have places? I don't like to have a landfill in the city, as I'd seen it in Bangalore, uh, because this is, must not be. But we have to find places where we can operate uh, uh, sustainable. And yeah, my 32nd oh, thing yeah. is these decentralized systems like they have in Pune, the five ton biodigesters. And the other thing that Pune has done is that they collect uh, waste and they make a slurry of it and then they the organic waste and they send it to a plant that is outside of the city limits. So those are two separate solutions. Yeah, so that means we go uh, in terms of uh, where comes the feedstock, where comes the clean feedstock, uh, very much recommendation decentralized systems yeah cooperation with other sector yeah yeah or not yeah uh, 
not one large plant 50 kilometers away to give the the alternative yeah <laughs> um yeah uh, we need to talk obviously to city planners and others yeah in order uh, to really uh, embed that in the in the city fiber and as it comes to the output as nimi mentioned yeah we have a lot of digestate which we might not be able to use directly in the city so we need to have probably other options for that as well yeah um 